Richard, what did you bring to the table today? So speaking on trust, how, I want to get your guys' opinion on how, how you build trust with your management team above you. All right. Like how, because I'm having a hell of a time right now knowing, um, like, I trust my service manager. Um, I'm just having a hell of a time right now trusting, knowing how much trust I can put in my upper management team, if that makes sense. Right? Like, what? Because, like, that with with everything that that's gone on in my personal life and everything like that, I'm I've kind of pulled a lot away from how open I am with with them. Like, there's there's just honestly, there's just shit I don't want to tell them anymore. Like, I you know that that this, that's just the circumstance from from what's happened, right? So, um, I, I guess one of the first things that you have to look at and and we were just talking about how to you know step in a previous episode so to speak stefan was talking about how to build your team you've got a team that isn't necessarily listening or isn't necessarily following direction flip it on its head and 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 think about it put you in their shoes versus like normally you're talking to your techs and now you're going up. So now you're in the technician's shoes talking to the shop foreman. What would be the same things you would expect of them to do for you? And now you need to do for them. I think would be my first, first thought, like trust. We're still talking about trust. What do you, what are you willing to give? What are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to give up in order for them to build trust in you so that they can give you the tools and resources that you need to be successful? That would be my my first thought as the, the self-accountability function. Now, that's a double-edged sword, right? You give anyone, doesn't matter whether it's tech to foreman or foreman to service manager or foreman to for GM or foreman to whoever, you give up personal information of any kind that can be used against you. We've, I'm, I'm sure all five of us have stories that, that can illustrate when we gave up personal information of some description to leadership and it was used against us and we either got fired for it. We got suspended for it. We got docked for it. We got reprimanded for it. Whatever the case may be, that that personal tidbit ended up somewhere it, it really shouldn't be or in the hands of somebody it really shouldn't be. The challenge is that I see is that if you don't give up personal information, you you no longer allow somebody in your own little circle of safety, as it were, that that's also felt. I would suggest that if your GM doesn't feel like you tr- that you trust them, they're not going to start trusting you with the big decisions, with with the big money, with the big position change, with the big promotion change, with the big opportunities that come down. If they don't have have something that says, you know, they trust me and, and put their trust in me to make good decisions, I'm not likely to give them the benefit of, of all the positive energy that I'm putting out. I'd like to hear what what everybody's tidbit is on this, because this is this is a an important topic and I think it's even more important than it sounds right now because I think this is a lot of technicians especially in that 10 plus year category that are starting to look at ways to take their career to the next level whether it's become a shop foreman or become a service manager or take on an outside role that requires a promotion or requires more money we've talked about confidence we talked about all those kinds of things but I think this is this is this is an important question. How do I garner trust or how do I trust leadership as someone in a senior technician or shop foreman role? Russell? Mm 
That's uh, that's a tough question, and it goes back to our our negativity issues because we're in in a business where there are conflicting interests. the The technician has an interest in making the most money possible. The service advisor has an interest in uh, getting their their project done. The service manager has an interest in the overall shop performance, not necessarily one particular individual. Um, the fixed ops manager has an interest across uh, several shops. The GM has an interest about how the whole store is doing. And so my interest may not coincide with the interest of the GM or of the fixed ops manager. Um, so we we have this conflict of interest and how do we, how do we learn to understand the other side? You know, when the fixed stops manager isn't going to share everything that he knows, that's just, that's, that's how it is. It, I, I hate to say it, but the more they share with us, the more we learn, the better we get, the more threat we are to take their job. So they're not going to share. Um, you're going to have to go and learn that elsewhere. And by the same token, you know, do we spill our life story in hopes that they will have place our interest? Um, I think one in 10 will care about their people, but the other 90%, they're, they're, they've got other interests. So you, what I have done in the past, um, I would go in to the office and just sit there and listen to the, the manager ramble. He loved to talk. I would go in there with an issue that I wanted dealt with. Um, sometimes it got talked about. Most of the time it didn't. I'd let him ramble. Um, and by doing that, I was able to address my guy's concerns. Um, my concerns were rare that they got addressed. But if I would come in with, you know, hey, can we get so-and-so training? Can we get, you know, this guy's been doing an outstanding job. Can we do anything for him? Can we help him out with his tools? Can we um, can we get him a pay raise? He, he, he seemed to respond well to that. So as long as I was addressing those kind of concerns, I could get it addressed. My issues, yeah, well, when the sharing stopped, that was the the telltale to me that um, it was time to to move on. You know, the the trust was broken. It was it was the end of the relationship. And um, one, once trust is broken, you just I don't know. It's really I can't hard to recover back. when the tr once the trust is broken. So like it's I, I would say it's nearly impossible to get the trust back if it's broken, right? Yeah, yeah. In my case, at least. So I've done a whole lot of rambling and beating around the bush. Um, but if you can't trust your leadership, um, if you have tried to talk to them um, and they just prove to be untrustworthy, um, there's really nothing you can do at that point. You know, you, you've done your best. You've tried. You've, you need to walk. You need to find somewhere where you can be, you are trusted, where the people are trustworthy. And, um, you know, you're, you're in the business long enough that, you know, the tool truck drivers, you know, the, um, you know, what technicians across numerous shops, you've got, you're on forums, you can talk to people, um, you know, you know, guys that come in and really make a whirlwind difference, but they're gone in two, three years, four years at the most. You know, so do you want to hitch yourself to that person when you know that at most he's going to be there four years? Um, you know, but once once the trust is broken or once the, the person has proved to not be trustworthy, I don't think there's any fixing, at least not from my experience. Okay, so let's let's talk about that a little bit before before we hear from the rest of the crew a little bit. Is there something that 
you can tell that technician out there that's in that circumstance, like, like you were, where their trust is broken in some way capacity. Because I believe that somebody should always be given second, but not a third chance. It's two strikes and you're out. What is something that you have tried in the past, whether it's successful or not? What is something that you've tried in the past in order to curate some kind of trust building after some kind of trust loss event has occurred? I have one story. Um, I was working at a shop. I, we had been doing, you know, about 40 hours a week. Um, the, we had two techs that cared and three that didn't. Um, but I had developed a friendship with one of the techs that didn't. Um, and, uh, I was sharing with him some of the frustration and, um, everything that I told him, he went straight to the service manager. At that point, I had one goal in life as a tech, and that was to become a GM world-class technician. I had, um, two certifications to go. Um, one to get the world class and then one I just wanted because it was the, the diesel certification. Um, so I had these two tests to go and I was scheduled a uh, wait list for the diesel and actually scheduled for the, the last one, the, the, um, uh, drivetrain manual transmissions. Um, and I open my computer and I have this email that my classes have been canceled. And I'm like, what's going on here? And I went up and the service manager was the quiet furious. And um, his response was, um, you're leaving. Why should I invest in you? And I'm like, I never said I was leaving. And he said, well, so-and-so told me about it. And... Um, after, you know, going home, praying on it, getting getting myself together, I came back and I said, okay, can I earn the trust back? Um, and I made, I made an offer, you know, to do, to do a certain amount of work, to not look at leaving or anything, and um, to not, not even go on the job boards and, you know, give you, give you three months to earn the, earn the trust back. But, it didn't happen, you know, so I, I tried. That was the only time I've tried. It was a lesson, several lessons, you know, don't share with the other guys. Don't talk about your next plan. Don't talk about your money. Don't talk about your sex life. Just they don't need to know it. It's none of their business. Um, if you can have a tight group like we are here um, that you can talk to, but don't talk about it in any kind of public forum. You know, we, we have a quiet forum that nobody ever sees except the, this group um, that we can talk about these things. But once it goes out in public, anybody can see it. Anybody can be involved in it. Um, you, you have to be careful about the information you put out because um, you can you can destroy your career by oversharing. So you you. you have to develop a, a tight knit group that you can trust. Um, and then when it comes to work, go in, be quiet, be professional, and have a plan to kill everybody in the room, to quote General Mattis. But, <laughs> you know, you, you, they're not your friends. They're there to do a job. You're there to do a job. Get your job done. Go home. It's a challenge. Like you're you're in a position where building building relationships both both by hierarchy alone above you and below you requires you to build trust. And in order for people to start trusting you, you know, one of the basic things is you gotta you gotta do what you say you're gonna do. I think that's first and foremost. I think that's one of the easiest things that you can do to build trust is is say you're gonna do something because that means that somebody can hold you accountable to it and then actually do that thing. That's one of the easiest way to build trust. And you got to do that thousands upon thousands of times um, because it's, it's a low level trust building thing. The higher level trust building things are 
doing things for other people. Say you're going to do something for somebody else and then successfully doing it. That's a much higher, higher level, much bigger trust building thing to do. The challenge is when you start to get personal and, and like you said, Russell, not sharing certain things um, with certain people and sometimes not sharing things at all. The challenge with doing that is that it's awfully hard to build trust because you haven't given something personal that theoretically can be leveraged. And I think that's a, that's a human psychological thing is if you give up something personal to somebody, no matter how low level it is, when you give up something personal that they could in theory use leverage against you, it means that you are showing them, you trust them with that piece of leverage. The challenge is if you give that to the wrong person, they will absolutely use it against you. So it's, it's learning your own line of where that, what is acceptable to share and what is not. Everybody's line is going to be a little bit different, but I would suggest that, you know, it's for the most part, we all know exactly where it is. Richard, I, I appreciate the question. That's this is this is going to go deep, Marshall. I'm I'm looking forward to what what you have to have to say. So I'm going to bring it back. So we said, uh, how do you gain some influence or some trust with the management team, right? Correct. So um, I think this is my approach. Uh, Love it or hate it, I guess. Um, I am uh, most of the time pretty brutally honest with my management team. So, you know, a, a, a quick for instance is you guys remember last year I got a a, a job offer uh, from a competitor, a foreman role of a hundred k salary. You guys remember that? We talked about it privately in our group chat. And I took that job offer in paper, gave it to my manager and said, just letting you know, I got this job offer. I'm not taking it, but I want you to know that I got it. And I just left it at that. That was the conversation. He said, okay. And I walked out of the room. Never heard anything about it. Never said anything about it. Never held anything against me. Never did anything with it. That was it. That was the end of it. But I think what that created was a little bit of loyalty to him because he knew that I wasn't going to do anything. And if there was something in the future that I may actually have action on, that I, I would probably come to him with it and give him an opportunity to, I don't know. But regardless, I feel like that is the kind of the approach I've always taken. I didn't go to one of my bay mates or anything like that. One of the guys that I work with or anything like that. I took it straight to, so he could hear it from the horse's mouth. I didn't tell anybody, you know, to Russell's point, I didn't tell anybody else, but I went straight to the manager. So he did, it wasn't hearsay. It wasn't secondhand. It wasn't telephone. Like, boom, here it is. This in the black and white, this is the job offer I got. I have decided I'm not going to take it, but I just want you to know that I had that opportunity and I passed on it so I could stay here and work for you. Um, the other thing is, is uh, I think um, when you use that influence that you have uh, to gain that influence, I, um, I don't really do a whole lot of personal stuff. I may say, oh, yeah, I'm building a fence in my backyard this weekend or something like that. Small talk, personal stuff, but nothing really crazy, I think. Nothing super personal, but, you know, working on the yard, you know, because they always say, what are you doing this weekend? And I so, oh, taking the kids fishing or whatever like that, but nothing that doesn't go. It's kind of uh, surface level personal, I would say. Um, so as far as the personal side of it, that's the approach I take with that. And then um, I'm trying to think, you know, I feel like, uh, like I said, the, when I, the approach I take is very brutally honest. So if I got a problem, I'll go straight to them and say, hey, this is fucked up. This is messed up. This is messed up. And, uh, you know, I'm, I am one text message away from another job. So let's just get this squared away and we can move on. I like working here and I would rather stay here. 
So let's just keep it square. You know, um, that's the approach that I've always taken. Um, in order for those type of that approach to work is you have to add a lot of value to your shop. So if you are a five year technician, say, uh, working your way up, now's the time to start adding a lot of value to yourself by doing the training, keeping your head down, keeping your nose down, doing the training that is re that is required by your OEMs. Get as much training, swallow the training up, go out of your way to get the training and um, do as much cross training as possible. Add as much value as you possibly can to yourself because when the management team sees your value, they will listen when you have something to say. And uh, and that's that's the approach I've just always taken it. And I take all of that value that I have added to myself and I pour it into my apprentices. So they get the value from the get go. So they 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 get all that extra from from the the star and they they get to build on that value that i've already given them which makes them more valuable makes them be able to negotiate their salaries and and those things when i'm not around anymore to help them negotiate it for them so it, it really snowballs for you once you start adding that value to yourself but i think adding value and and once you have the value the management team sees the value, then you leverage the value that you have. Um, okay. Then you can choose I, I how. Think, I think Richard really has a it. big problem with. He, he, Richard does not know how to be brutally honest. <laughs> I can't say that with a straight face. <laughs> but I think to your point, Marshall, is the, the training does come into play. Let's assume for a second that Richard doesn't have master tech status in like four fucking brands for a second. And let's assume somebody out there who's listening, who's in somewhat of a similar circumstance, but doesn't have literally just about every possible training you can possibly fucking imagine on at least three brands. I think because uh, you've got your full master in Ford, Nissan and in Chevy. So I think there is no doubt in my fucking mind, the level of technical value that you have specifically, but let's say broader spectrum that we're not literally talking about you and in, in your specific position. I think taking that one step further is the training outside of the technical, right? As someone, uh, I know that you read, I know that you are active in uh, jujitsu, you are bettering yourself outside but i think i think perhaps and this regularly comes up in coaching doing training that has nothing to do nothing specifically to do with our trade but has indirect value proposition to it so these are things like salesmanship learning how to sell if you do a online course or read a book about or whatever the case may be about learning how to sell better or you read leadership books in some capacity or do leadership courses in some capacity, something that you can quantify to your leadership that you are growing as a human being outside of the technical training aspect that you are becoming a better leader, a better person, a better a team player, a better something to differentiate yourself outside of just the technical skill value. Because I think that's what starts to separate us as as leaders from doers i think just kind of i don't know whether that's the right word or not but as a technician we do we fix we diagnose we fix we repair we move on to the next one as shop foreman especially as um separating the two between because we have one of each we have a non-working foreman and we have a working foreman when you are a still working foreman, you are still doing the diagnose, the repair, and on to the next car thing. As you're also doing the leadership thing, your experience is going to teach you certain things, but it's very difficult for you to convey to your leadership, especially as a non-working foreman, the value you bring that isn't, I do this. From a non-working perspective, 
Stefan's going to have a laundry list of things in theory anyway, or non-working foremen out there are going to have a laundry list of things that is expected of them that isn't production, right? It's going to be a far more easy time for them to quantify the, the value you bring as a non-working foreman because you have a job description that isn't fixing cars all day. It is literally about leading the team. So perhaps your quote unquote job description, if it's not well designed enough, needs to be customized more to make sure that training soft skills is on there as part of the goals they have for you. Um, maybe the leadership portion of your role needs to be better defined on your job description so they know the things that you are doing day to day. I don't know if it's there or not, but for anybody listening that's in a working foreman role, making sure that the clarity is in your job description, the thing that you've signed and they've signed that everybody's happy with. Because I think one of the concerns I've been brought to by senior technicians is that their job description is vague at best. It's mostly about fixing cars. It's fixing problem cars and fixing cars, especially from a working perspective. You've been given the title of shop foreman without any autonomy, without any authority, without a clear, concise job description that includes leadership. If you don't have those things, you can't be as successful as someone with a very clear job description, even that alone, right? So let's, let's, I, I want to hear from Stefan, what would you, what would you say that you do or have done or would like to do that would help you foster trust with your leadership? With, with my, my direct managers right now, I mean, with two, two guys that are new to the building, new to the brand, um, but they have experience, you know, three times as much as, as I do in the trade. So, you know, they, they know how it is to be a mechanic. They have, one of them has a technician background. Um, so I, I do find that with, with any technician to technician, that does take a period of time to essentially win somebody over and say, hey, man, I, I know what I'm talking about. Now you just got to trust me. So it's one of these things, right? It's, it's the same individual just wearing a different name tag and in a different position, but we're kind of hold fast on who we trust and how quickly we trust them. So with my, with my general manager, a lot of it's just been finding transparency in the business and just kind of knowing why do we make the decisions that we make when as a technician, I can't understand why we would do that. Or what does this have to do with me? Why does it matter to me, et cetera? So, you know, having more EV trained guys allows the dealership to support more EV customers and that works with the sales team in allocations, sales of vehicles, and go full circle. You're getting these vehicles back a lot more often. There's just more customers that you can now serve, and it generally impacts the business in a positive manner. But when you're a technician at a lower level, a lot of this information doesn't make its way to you because it's deemed, well, that's not really important for them to know. And it's like, well, everyone's in the, the same building and a part of the same team. So why wouldn't we try to influence each other and say, hey, look, small actions have big results, right? If 20 guys are doing what you need them to do, that's going to result in just an overall better production, better facility, etc. But they got to know kind of what they're working towards as well. So, you know, a lot of times decisions will come from above that you have no way to quantify or even understand. Why are we doing this? And if it's not explained, well, then it's really hard to trust that what's being told to you is beneficial to the business in any way, shape, or form. So a lot of times the way I'm, I'm trying to work with those above me is showing them that, you know, hey, listen, I'm the wealth of knowledge. Whatever technical questions you have, I'm not going to lead you down the wrong line. I'm going to try to work with my techs because I have a longer standing relationship than you do. So I give my manager all the good news to share to the shop. Hey, man, you know what? There's good and bad news. You can be good cop. I'll play the bad cop. The guys will respond a little bit better if the negativity comes from me um, because I know how to talk to technicians. Why? Because I am. Um, so the, the mindset of a tech is very different, I think, from a lot of positions in the dealership. And I'm sure we can you know, bash our heads against the wall for hours on this. But 
you, you got to know how to talk to, to your guys. And I feel like that is lost with, with just upper management just because they're not used to it if they don't have that tech background. So, again, a lot of management comes from the sales side or even the service advisor side. To actually be a person that wrenches, it's very rare to see them in, in a position like that. And as a result now, most techs just figure the highest they're going to get is to the former position, and then that's it for them. There is no way to go. It's very glass ceiling. And, you know, I, I think the perception is that you you can't do better in a dealership. That's it. That's all you're going to be able to, to do. And when you really start looking at some of the higher levels of management it's a lot of numbers it's a lot of money it's it's a lot of hoops that you got to jump through and and i think a lot of skills that you have as a tech will transfer you just got to believe it and you you got to kind of trust the process but i also know that it's basically laid out in front of you there's always a master plan at hand um someone does have to look out for you and hopefully guide you along that way so just like we sit here and say that, you know, some techs will never be good techs and some techs will never make good flat rate techs, some foremen will never make good service managers or fixed ops managers unless something is either put into a groundwork situation where it's like, look, with a little bit of work on this end and this end, you can get there. And if if a tech never sees that production or that process or throughout a store, it's very hard for them to believe they'll ever do more than just turn a wrench. Some guys are okay with that. However, wouldn't it be nice to say, hey, you know, the general manager of that store was actually a technician for 20 years, you know, and and it, it is kind of cool to see that, that it's not someone that just came from work area or another discipline, et cetera, that just kind of shoveled into this position to deal with those and the whatnot, because that's really what it is. I mean, GM does, you know, show me a couple things and it's like, uh, wow, I wouldn't want to be trying to deal with that circus. I'm just going to go back to uh, taking care of things because I can handle that for the most part. So I think, you know, trusting upper management, you kind of have, you have a choice in the matter. I think obviously the more you trust them and you more, the more you believe that they're there for your better interest, the better interest of the company, you kind of have to go along with it. But, you know, Russ touched on a good couple of things. You you got to be cautious, but also careful with what you share, not just with upper management, but just with coworkers in general. Perception of people can, can change very quickly if they find out personal things. And you don't want to lose an image from someone that, you've looked up to over the years and you've respected over the years and all of a sudden it takes, you know, one What's that, that phrase is, is never meet your heroes. Yeah. Never, yeah. Never, yeah. never, never meet your heroes. I, I think yeah. the, the opposite is also true is somewhere along the lines of you don't, the last thing you want to do is if you meet your heroes, the last thing you want to do is disappoint your heroes once you find them. And then, or the opposite side of that coin is if you meet your heroes and they're not what you had the perception that you had is is not even remotely close to the real image. Yeah, and, I think and, all all of this is, is great uh, feedback for someone trying to foster growth in themselves in order to gain the trust of their leadership. The whole process is a challenge. You right from day one, whether you're whether you've been promoted to to shop foreman or service manager or whatever the case may be from a store after being there for a period of time. And, and now you're trying to garner trust, more trust from leadership because if they promoted you, they obviously trust you some. Um, but the question is whether they trust you enough to do the role that you've now been promoted to. The secondary portion is garnering the trust of, of leadership that have just hired you into a leadership role of some description. You know, what do you do? What do you say? You know, how do you act? So on and so forth. But I think the lessons that we've learned just in the recording session this evening you know, talking about improving your professionalism, talking about, you know, how do you garner trust uh, with the team that you're leading? How do you garner with the trust with the, the leadership that you have from above? And I think all of it comes back to trust, like almost all of this conversation that we've had for, we're going on like two and a half hours, boys, that's going to get pushed out into several different pieces, right? Three, three, like, all of it comes back to trust, building trust with yourself, building trust uh, with the team that you're leading, building trust with the people that are leading you. 
like whether whether it's through being more being a better professional whether it's being a better human whether it's being better trained in the technical skill whether it's being better trained in the soft skills all of those things uh better yourself but also help curate more trust in in yourself and those around you right all of those pieces fall into place there is no one thing that you can do to make that you know that that silver bullet it's the it's the thousand gold, golden bb rule right it's not one thing that's going to fix all of this and it's not one thing that's you know that's going to build all of this this house up so that you can be successful it's all of the little things it's getting your training it's learning how to communicate it's reading more so you have a better vocabulary it's you know building the trust in your team by doing things that you say you're going to do communicating and learning how to communicate more effectively whether it's through just reading and get yourself get your vocabulary to a level that you're capable of of translating what's on your technical page to somebody who is non-technical eloquently and simply and effectively and clearly and concisely like like Russell would say like all of these pieces come back to building trust the service advisor if they trust you they're going to they're going to sell your work more effectively if the service manager trusts you they're going to give you more opportunities if your team as a as a leader if your team trusts you they're going to give you not only more work they're going uh, and I don't mean that in a negative space but they're going to give you more output of work right if the team trusts you they're going to share the piece of information they they need to share in order for them to be more successful but if you were to use it improperly you would be using it against but you've built that trust. If leadership trusts you, they're going to give you more opportunities for, for growth, whether it's through promotion, through training, through this or that. Trust is like the core of it all, right? And whether you're building a business on yourself, uh, meaning you're out in your own shop in your backyard and you're trying to build a business, or whether you're working for somebody in a, in a multi-roof top store franchise, like it doesn't matter. It comes back to trust. I think that's, a, that's, that's the core of it. Awesome. I think that's a great a great way to to end off the recording today because I think I'm I'm my brain is swollen from all of this. Okay, well I, I just I'll leave you with a one off from the old Tony Owens. Good, better, best. Never let it rest until good is better and better is best. God, I love Tony. That is one of the greatest phrases. Let's let's I'm just gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna kill it there. Folks, send it. <laughs>